My name is Joseph Kubas. I'm the Director of Institutional Advancement here at ASB. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Ghazali. Dr. Ghazali obtained an MD and PhD in Neuroscience at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, completed clinical residency in Neurology at the University of Pennsylvania, and postdoctoral training in Cognitive Neuroscience at UC Berkeley. He is the founding director of the Neuroscience Imaging Center at UC San Francisco, an associate professor in neurology, physiology, and psychiatry, and principal investigator of a cognitive neuroscience laboratory. His research has significantly expanded our understanding of alterations in the aging brain that lead to cognitive decline. His most recent studies explore how we may enhance our cognitive abilities and or prevent them from declining in various neuropsychiatric conditions via engagement with custom-designed video games. Dr. Ghazale has, has authored over 70 scientific articles and delivered over 250 presentations around the world. Recently, he wrote and hosted the nationally televised PBS-sponsored special, The Distracted Mind with Dr. Adam Ghazale. Awards and honors for his research include the Pfizer AFAR Innovations in Aging Award, the Ellison Foundation New Scholar Award in Aging, and the Harold Brenner Papinski Early Career Award in Neurobehavioral Science. Tonight, Dr. Ghazale will present novel insights on a multimodal educational approach directed at the fundamental information processing systems of the brain. His talk will include a discussion of the potential use of action video game mechanics, neurofeedback, and direct brain stimulation to drive neuroplasticity during the learning process. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ghazale. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to start by considering how education might benefit from coming to the time period that we can now use the breakthroughs in neuroscience and inspirations to guide the educational process itself. We know that the brain, in all its wondrous complexity, is essentially an information processing system whose primary function is to receive information and, in and guide our interactions with the environment. However, education is a multifaceted endeavor, that we know. I propose that enhancing the core cognitive operations that guide cognition in its most fundamental form should be a core part of our education system. Let's first pause and consider what education and cognition really have in common. We know that the neural processes used to organize information are the fundamentals of cognition, and this can be broken down into several domains. The selection of information is attention. Interpretation of information or perception. Retaining and retrieving information as memory. Reasoning based on information is decision making and actions based on information in the form of our motor responses and speech output, which is part of our language. These are all the essence and the fundamentals of how cognition is constructed and how it emerges from these properties of our brain. If we're going to consider that cognitive enhancement should be a core aspect of our education system, I think we'll benefit from taking a step back and looking at the larger landscape that comprises cognitive enhancement so we can make decisions about anything on this list that might play a role in the educational system. This would be an example of, uh, the of, of what education and cognitive enhancement might work together, and that is the amplification or extension of core abilities of the mind via augmentation of information processing systems. So let's take a look at what the landscape that currently exists to enhance cognition. Education itself exists when it's doing the, uh, a strong job at improving these abilities, but also things like meditation, cognitive training, enriched environments. These ways of interacting with our environments in very targeted ways have been shown to improve cognition. There's another way, action video games, I'm gonna tell you some data about that, that has also been shown to have strong impacts on cognitive abilities. 
we have also developed drugs, sometimes for the purpose and sometimes as a side effect that was not planned, that have been shown to increase cognition. Ritalin, Adderall, Modafinil, Aricept. These medications have largely been developed with neuropsychiatric conditions in mind. Uh, for instance, Alzheimer's disease and ADHD. However, we should be aware that many of these drugs, for example, for example, Adderall used frequently on college campuses to improve cognition, or at least to try to. So we should be aware that medications may have a role in this. The other recent finding, and one that has been becoming more and more uh, frequent in the literature, is that things that we do to help our body also help our brains. So physical exercise and nutrition have been shown through very nice work to also be cognitive enhancers. Neurofeedback. There's an interesting line of research that shows that if we can be made aware of our own brain signals, in, we can guide our uh, training regimen using it as a feedback routine, and this can be shown to also improve cognitive abilities. Neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is the direct stimulation of the brain, either with a magnetic field in transcranial magnetic stimulation, or with a di direct electrical current, that's known as transcranial direct current stimulation. This is done at the level of the scalp, to change activity within the brain. Another approach is brain-computer interfaces, which is usually done for more um, extreme conditions and, and medical conditions. And this is where an actual electrode is placed inside the brain to stimulate it to improve cognitive abilities and other types of neural functioning. And perhaps the most extreme is actually genetic modifications. So I'm not going to propose that all of these should be part of our educational system, but we should at least be aware of the landscape that exists. I'm now going to tell you about some research in our lab that combines three of these, action video games, neurofeedback, and neuromodulation, in an approach that I, can, that I call closing the loop. So I'm going to take you through some of this right now. But first, we want to pause and talk about video games. So as we know, video games are one of the most powerful forms of media. And why is that? Well, they're interactive. That's probably number one. But they also turn out to be reasonably fun, which is another part of what makes them so uh, ubiquitous in their uptake around the world. So we're seeing an increase in video games being played by both genders and across all ages. I want to tell, tell you about one specific type of video game. Video games is a large field, but what I want to talk to you about are action video games and the last decade of research that has made some very surprising findings. So work largely done by Daphne Beverly and her colleagues over the last 10 years has shown that action video games can actually have the impact of improving attentional and perceptual abilities. This includes resistance of distraction, an increase in the capacity of attention, and even a visual ability known as contrast sensitivity. This has been first shown in young adults that played a lot of video games compared to those that did not. And you could see these rather startling differences when you look at laboratory tests of uh, attention and distraction resistance. But in probably more powerful studies, comparisons have been made on training young adults that did not have video game experience. And this was either done with a first-person shooter game, which is sort of the characteristic of an action video game, or Tetris. And what they found in this study with even just a short period of training, 10 hours of gameplay, it's the group that played Medal of Honor in this um, in this study that showed these improvements and these same abilities that those uh, young adults that played these for extensive periods of time compared to the control group, which was Tetris. So we know that there's some aspect of these games, presumably the high interference involvement, the ability, the need to distribute attention, the high reward and emotional aspects that drive the dopamine system that really lead to these to have a strong impact on cognition. There's uh, some interesting data that's come uh, out more frequently that shows that the brains of young adults that are heavy video game players versus the, those that are not show some very distinct differences when you record brain activity while they're doing a, a high demand cognitive task. So we see that action video gamers process distracting information less, meaning that they suppress that information that's irrelevant. And they engage less brain areas, as you can see in this image here, when they're doing de more demanding tasks, uh, indicating that they're more efficient at how they use their brain uh, when something uh, is very challenging. I want to now tell you about some work that we're doing in our laboratory um, for where, where we're interested in designing customized games to target neural processes and information processing resources and see if we can 
improve cognitive abilities after our participants in our research studies spend some time engaging in these tasks. So this game that I'm going to show you now was developed in our lab around five years ago. And what you can see here is a car is being driven by a participant. It's winding. There are hills. It's very hard to do this. And then they're making decisions about these signs. They're only responding to the green circles. This is a perceptual discrimination task. And they're ignoring other signs, like this green pentagon, which is actually very hard to ignore. And so what we have are, are participants in this study that are engaging in two streams of information processing with two tasks that have independent goals. And this would fall into the class of tasks known as multitasking. And what we've recently found in a group of older adults that trained on this type of video game, that we can improve their ability to multitask, but also their ability to sustain attention on different tasks, as well as the working memory. So we see, and we have many other experiments in our laboratory ongoing to look at how these games could have strong impact, not just on older adults, but on children as well. I now want to take uh, a look at, um, oh, we don't have that up here right now. So one thing that we're doing is we're trying to develop video games that can leave the laboratory and be more accessible. So what you could see in this image here is an iPad that shows uh, a new, a different version of the game that was adopted to be more accessible using a mobile platform. Another goal of ours is to see if we can maintain the fun and engagement, in including for children to be immersed in these games without having the violence. So increasing the amount of art and music and story so that they are engaging and fun. But one very important aspect that we um, develop in all of these games is adaptivity. And by that, I mean that as the participant plays the game, in real time, the game becomes more difficult as performance improves. What this does is it keeps the person engaged in the game right on that perfect sweet spot, where it's not too hard that they're frustrated, it's not too easy that they're bored. And this really challenges their abilities, and we think maximally drives plasticity in their brain and improves their cognition. So this is what I mean by closing the loop. We have the brain on one side, and when you make a decision, it guides your behavior, and then this influences the game. The game reacts adaptively in real time to challenge you, which changes the environment, and then cycles back to the brain to close the loop and changes your brain. So this is this two-way road between how we interact with our environment and an environment that's responsive to us, how it can act to change our brain. And this has been the large majority of, what, of the research that we've done in this field. One thing that we're interested in now is actually creating a neural loop. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Um, it's meant to act in complement to that loop that I've already described. So how we do this is we first have, have our participants in our laboratory play these video games while we record brain activity in real time. So this is an example of someone playing a game with a high-density EEG cap. This records the electrical activity in the brain. And we can see what are the neural markers while someone is engaging in the game that is related to their performance, their high level of performance. One marker that I want to mention to you is known as midline frontal theta. It's a low-frequency oscillation that we could pick up with EEG that we've shown now in our laboratories related to performance. So when this measure is higher, when one of those signs come up, you do better on the task. And we could see that this measure decreases as you get older, and that's also related to the change of performance. We can also see that when we train a brain, it's these very measures that seem to improve along with their performance on the task. So we have a marker in the brain that tells us the depth of engagement that someone that's playing this game is investing into the task, and it's related to their performance. Another study in the lab is to use direct current stimulation to the brain to see if we could change plasticity. So what you're looking at here is transcranial direct current stimulation cap. And what this is is an amazing phenomenon that there's now um, a wealth of data uh, revealing that if you stimulate the brain through the scalp with even the power of a 9-volt battery and you have someone engage in a task, the rate of learning is faster. Um, so what we're interested in, can you use the dynamics of the video game and the mechanics to feed back and stimulate the brain to encourage plasticity? And so what you can see here is the, the behavioral and environment loop that I already traced, and that's something that we're already working very hard on. But you can imagine that if neural data is being stimulated and then applied into the software platform, the game would change in response to what is going on in your brain. So example, if attention deviates, 
the game can change its mechanics to pull you back in and to really help you learn how to control your attention in a goal-directed way. On the other side of the loop, a game could be used to stimulate the brain, to uh, lead to stimulation in select areas, also to improve plasticity and to um, increase learning on this particular targeted mechanism. Now, now, I'm not suggesting that this type of approach might be uh, used in the classroom, although it might, but this might be the type of approach, at least on the EEG side, that could be used at home to help improve, for example, attentional abilities in someone that needs extra work. The other side, the neural um, stimulation side, that might be for, uh, more reserved for people that have brain disorders, where you really need to encourage plasticity so that they can play on, you know, be on the same playing field and to have the same type of impact from the educational system. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of where we can go. I think the most important point is to not think about all of these areas that impact cognitive enhancement as silos, but to think about how they can work together, such as meditation, physical exercise, nutrition, in addition to the type of examples that I gave you today. So it is, um, uh, I think, really relevant for educators to realize that this is uh, a lot of the directions that neuroscience is taking to understand really how we can impact the basic mechanisms that underlie cognition uh, to improve them and lead to a big impact, hopefully, on the quality of our lives. Thank you for your attention.